Today, we're going to focus on the question of laughter. And we are lucky enough to have Mr. Ian Harris here today to discuss the use of comedy and humor when it comes to bridging gaps and provoking critical thinking. The first thing I thought of when I heard that was one of my favorite old Mark Twain quotes, which is, against the assault of laughter, nothing can stand. Now, Mr. Harris has been described as a free thought comedian. You can find him on iTunes, on Hulu, Google Play. You might have seen him on Jimmy Kimmel Live before. He's a regular contributor to U.S. Magazine, uh, Weekly Magazine's Fashion Police. He, he's worked not only as a stand-up comedian for a significant period of time, but also a film director with his first feature film, It Burns When I Laugh, along with uh, several short films, including music videos and now directing comedy specials for Friends. Um, but on top of that, in terms of his um, variety of experience, he's also a uh, mixed martial arts uh, trainer, uh, having his own fighting style called Fight Science. Um, so I don't know if that's going to be part of his routine here, but uh, we'll have to find out. In around 2006, he took a hiatus for his family from stand-up, but back in 2011, he came back to, uh, with a new focus on skepticism and uh, secular thought with a comedy tour called the Evolution of Comedy Show Tour. He's a regular speaker for the Secular Students Alliance, Atheists United, and other secular groups. And I hope all of you will join me in welcoming Mr. Ian Harris. Thanks. So, whoa, that is loud, sorry. Um, well, thank you guys for having me. First off, did anybody come to the show last night? We had comedy here, a few of you. Okay, cool, <laughs> thank you for coming. For those of you who didn't, um, let me tell you what, what I do. I am a uh, stand-up comedian, so I am a speaker, but this speaking about, um, about comedy is a little bit different. I do it, done it a few times, but it, it's not my normal my normal uh, avenue for, for, for um, being in front of a mic. I, I'm used to up here telling jokes and, and swearing a lot. So I'm um, <laughs> going to hold off on that today. But I'll give you guys a little background about, about what I, who I am and what I do. Um, I'm a comedian. I've been a comedian for 22 years. And I grew up in a very liberal, uh, progressive area. I grew up in Santa Cruz, California, which is like a hippie commune gone awry or something. It's just, that's, that's how it is. And, and, and I grew up with, in the 80s for the most part, my formative years were the 80s. So I grew up punk rock kids from hippie parents. So we, when I grew up, there wasn't any, I, I, I hear stories from people who are, who are, uh, grew up in religious communities, who grew up in the parts of the South and the Midwest and these places where 90% where of the people were Christian and, and they weren't and they had to deal with it. I didn't have to deal with that. I was lucky enough to um, I, in fact, I didn't even know people were religious in my community until much later. I just assumed everyone was like me. And I, I grew up an atheist. I grew up a skeptic. Um, my father was an atheist. My mom is not. Um, she's, she's not religious, but she's new agey. My mom is a self-proclaimed psychic, which um, is great fodder for a comedian who does skepticism. Um, but I, so I did grow up with some magical thinking in my house. But for the most part, I didn't have to deal with deal with. Uh, religious, you know, people trying to impose their, their will on me or, or any of this sort of stuff. It just, it just wasn't, we were such an open community in Santa Cruz that I, I didn't have to deal with it. That being said, I love to argue. Um, and really quick, just so you know, like the kind of, the, the way I, uh, my dad would never have called himself an atheist, but my dad would um, say stuff like the one time when I was seven years old and I spent the night at a friend's house and I called him up and I said, hey dad, they want me to, they want you to come and bring me some nice clothes because tomorrow uh, I guess we're going to church. And my dad's response to, I'll come and rescue you. That was his response. <laughs> so he didn't bring me nice clothes. He came and just picked me up and we went to IHOP or something. Like that was, that was uh, my dad's response to me going to church. So I didn't, I hadn't gone, I didn't go to church till much later. I went, you know, when I had a girlfriend who was, whose family was religious and I went just to be nice. Um, so I, I hadn't, didn't grow up with any of that sort of stuff. And um, for me, the, uh, <laughs> I see it, I see that the way I am now, like I was very argumentative uh, as, as a kid. So, and I always wanted to be a comedian. And what happened though is I was so much into arguing and discussing and I didn't consider it arguing, I considered it discussing. I wanted to talk to people about what do you believe? What are these things that, you know, why do you believe this weird thing that, that, that I just don't get? You know, whether it was my mom and the psychic stuff or, or somebody who was, who was a Christian or somebody who was a, a Muslim or whatever in my community, I would ask them questions and I, and I would browbeat them. Like, even, in, even in high school, if, if I didn't understand why a certain law was passed, I would 
browbeat my, you know, my instructor until she would just say, shut up, get out of here, send me to the office. And, and that's just how I was. I was an argumentative person. I got to where people didn't want to talk to me because I would always just browbeat them about what they believe. And so what I began doing is, is using humor. Um, inadvertently, I would joke. I would make jokes. I would, I would write bits and write sketches and do these things. And I would, I would make jokes that would make light of situation. And people would go, inadvertently, they would start arguing with me. <laughs> I'd make a joke about whatever it is that I see and just leave it lying there. And then what would happen is they would say, wait a second. You're making fun of what, I'm, what I believe. Or you're, and then they would argue with me. And I was like, all right, good. I get an argument. That's how, how I started doing comedy. Um, and, and, and that's pretty much was, was the root of my comedy. And it's funny because I see that in my daughter now. I have a daughter who's 10 years old. When she was five, um, so first off, my, my daughter, we don't, I don't, we're not religious, but I let her believe some fun stuff as a kid. I don't want to take her fun away. Like she, you know, had fairies and, and believed in Santa Claus and all that kind of stuff. And, and my thought was eventually she'll get some evidence and she'll shed these beliefs, which of course she did. And I saw it almost as a, an exercise in skepticism where, okay, she believes in Santa Claus now, but she'll eventually get some evidence and she'll shed the Santa Claus thing. And, and, that's, and that's great. She'll learn to think critically. But when she was five, um, I picked her up from school. And again, we live in fair liberal Los Angeles. And I went to pick her up from school, you know, and she was, had the same process, thought process as me. Like she didn't realize that people in her school were religious. And kindergarten, pick her up in the car, laughing her ass off, hysterically. Like someone just told her the funniest joke she's ever, you've ever heard in, in her life, right? And I go, Bella, what is so funny? And she goes, Dad, I got to tell you this. You know Sarah? I go, yeah. She goes, did you know that Sarah believes in God? <laughs> and doesn't believe in Santa Claus. <laughs> she goes, we have evidence for Santa Claus, okay? <laughs> she goes, he brings us presents every Christmas. What the hell has God ever done for us? <laughs> exact words. And I was like, all right, that's my kid. Um, <laughs> But I, so, so, so people always ask me, they, they, those are the two questions, you know, I, we get this a lot, I do a lot of conventions, I do uh, humanist conventions and, and atheist conventions and science conventions and skeptic conventions and I do comedy for regular people, just regular comedy clubs and I don't, I, I never censor what I do. Um, and people always ask me, is that the right path? Is it, is, it, is it good to ridicule? That's what you're doing, you're up there, you're ridiculing people's beliefs or you're ridiculing people and is that the right thing to do? Isn't that lowering yourself? Um, and I've had, we've had these whole panel discussions at, at, at conventions and, and conferences where it's like, is this, is this the right way or is it the wrong way? Should we live and let live? Should we not make fun of people's beliefs? Should we let them have their thing? And, and I'm, I'm torn on that because I'm a comedian. And I, I think maybe on, on, the, on, that, on one on one, yeah, it's probably not the best idea to just go in and start you know, making fun of people's beliefs, of course. But for me, my thought is when every time someone says, well, you should, you know, live and let live, it's almost always one of my Christian friends that tell me that. And I'm like, well, that would be great if you played by those same rules. But the bottom line is you don't play by those same rules. They, you know, they, they're influencing um, policy. They're making laws. I mean, we're dealing with it right now. We see it in Indiana where they're, where they're doing it under the name of religious freedom. They're saying, I, you know, I just got into, was arguing with my cousin about him saying, you know, well, so you're saying, so you're being intolerant of my religious beliefs. That's what he said. He goes, you're being intolerant of my religious beliefs. I'm like, no, you're trying to discriminate against people and using your religious beliefs as, as a platform to be able to do that or as, as a shield to hide behind. And, I, and I'm like, that, that's not, that isn't correct. You know, and we're talking to him about it. And I said, you know, if you were, he said, well, you know, if you could, you could just go off and, you know, if you don't, if you don't want to, if you can't be served by this, by this place, why don't you just go to another, another restaurant, go to another, and I said, that's great when you're 90% of the population, because you can say that. You can say, well, you know, I'll just go to another place. He said, you know, if somebody didn't want to serve me, I would just, I would just go somewhere else. I go, yeah, because you have those options. If you lived in a 90% Muslim, Muslim city or country and you wanted to, and every piece of place didn't want to serve you because you're Christian, you couldn't just go to another place. I go, that's the point, is that it's, you know, so I'm having this discussion with my, um, with my cousin, and I'm, I'm realizing that, that there's two problems here is that one, people don't, a lot of people don't have empathy or they don't, they don't know how to put themselves in other people's shoes. Um, and the other thing is that magical thinking in general 
is harmful, even if you're not passing laws. Magical thinking creates other things that just as a society, it makes it hard to, just to talk with people. If people are, you know, we have subjects that are on the political spectrum. We have, you know, we have the, the, the anti-vaccine movement and we have, you know, discussions about GMOs and we have discussions about, about climate change and all these things. And if you, aren't, if you don't understand how to evaluate evidence and you don't understand what, where good evidence comes from and, and how to think critically, the dis, you don't, there's no point in even having a discussion. It's gonna become a battle. It's gonna become an argument if we can't have a discussion about it. So what I found in, in, in comedy is that um, what we do as comedians is we create analogies for the most part. We create analogies and we, we try to think of ourselves as philosophers. And this is, these are all comedians, not just people who, who get up here and make fun of religion like I do, but all comedians. That's what we do. We try to take things that we all see, we all do, and put a different, put a different spin on it, right? That's what, like Jerry Seinfeld, you know, I used to have a joke where he'd say, why is it that we drive in a parkway and we park in a driveway? We all have driven in a parkway and parked in a driveway and none of us have ever thought it. And then when you hear the joke, you go, yeah, yeah why is that? That's stupid, right? And it's a, I mean, it's a, a, a small little joke, but that's, that's, what, that's what comedians do. We look at things and we say, no one ever thinks about this. Here's a funny way of thinking about that. And, and I'm just pointing out the illogic or the logic or whatever it is in this in this thing that, I, that, I'm, that, that, we're, that I'm observing and showing you why it's, um, why it's silly. And it opens it up, it breaks down your barrier, your, your, your defenses, and allows you to go, allows the idea to sink in. And that's what all comedy does. So for me, well, by the way, did you guys ever see, um, anybody ever seen History of the World, uh, Mel Brooks movie? Yes? One of my favorite parts in that is he has, uh, he goes up to get his unemployment insurance, and she goes, he's a, he's a Roman, if you don't know, he's, he's supposed to be in Rome. And she goes, what's, you know, okay, what's your, what, what do you do? And he goes, I, I'm a stand-up philosopher. <laughs> she goes, oh, what? He goes, I'm a stand-up philosopher. He goes, I coalesce the vapor of human existence into a comprehensible fashion. She goes, oh, a bullshit artist. <laughs> and, and, you know, and essentially he's a stand-up comedian, but, but in, his, in that time, he would have been a philosopher. That's, that's, what, that's what it is. That's, that's what he does. That's what, what we do. So um, I have a few different uh, uh, comedy comedians that instead of doing my jokes that I'd like to, to, to share jokes that, that, uh, that, that what I mean as far as breaking down our barriers and sinking in a, an idea. Um, one of those is Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor is considered by most comedians the greatest comedian of all time, at least in the top two or three. Richard Pryor, not considered an atheist comedian, you wouldn't think of him as any of uh, as a as a, uh, a non-believer, any of that, that sort of stuff. But he has one of the greatest jokes I think ever written. He's doing a joke about vampires, about Dracula, about Dracula movies, and all the Dracula movies, and a black Dracula, and all this stuff about Dracula. You don't think it's going anywhere, but about Dracula, and he's making fun of Dracula, and you know, and you know, biting people's necks, and this whatever. It has nothing to do with anything. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he says, "You know, if Dracula comes up to you, they say you got to show Dracula a cross." because apparently vampires are allergic to bullshit. <laughs> and for a black man to say that in the 70s in a public forum in a theater is way beyond any, I mean, you know, anything that, that, that was expected at the time. But, but, and you know that probably 90% of his audience went, whoa, but they all laughed first because they all knew it was true. <laughs> they all laughed, and then they went, well, wait a second. <laughs> and that's what humor does. So, so my, my point is, when we, when we talk about, um, when we talk about you know, whether or not we should, you know, people, when people ask me, is it okay, are, is it, are you being fair or ridiculing people? And I'm like, I'm not ridiculing people. I'm making fun of ideas. And there's a difference, because our ideas are chosen. If I stood up here and made fun of, you know, um, made fun of racism and said this, you know, and, and, and ridiculed people with racist ideas, no one would think anything about it because you're not born a racist. You become a racist. You, 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 and it's a ridiculous, silly idea. So if I sit up here and make fun of the idea of racism, nobody has a problem with that. But in America, if I make fun of the idea of something else, um, another belief, and I'm not just talking about religion. It could be, you know, like I said, I do skepticism. It could be anything that I see as, as unfounded belief that's harmful. It's a belief. I'm not making fun of, fun of a, a, a people. I'm making fun of people who choose to believe those things, 
who choose to do those things. So first off, I don't have a problem with, with ridiculing. But second of all, I think that what we're doing in, in, with, with stand-up, what I do with stand-up comedy is, um, again, I'm trying to, we, we try to put people in a situation where they're comfortable. You come to a comedy club, you come to a show, you're comfortable, you're there to laugh. So if I can make you laugh and I can get you relaxed and break, break down your, your walls, then I can start explaining, making my analogies, explaining things that seep those ideas into your brain without becoming a battle, without making it a one-on-one -on -one argument, without making it a fight, without making it a, a political form. I'm just telling jokes, and if you happen to get something out of it, then you get something out of it. Um, a, couple of, a couple of examples for, for me where, where this has happened um, and uh, is years ago, 20 years ago plus, I did a joke on stage. It was almost just like last night. It was the night before Easter. Um, and I said, this is back before zombies were a big thing. Like nowadays, there's 20,000 shows about zombies and everybody does zombies. So I, I said on stage, I go, happy zombie day tomorrow, everybody. And nobody knew that hadn't been a thing yet, so nobody knew what I was talking about. And everyone looked at me and I said, happy zombie day tomorrow, everybody. And people kind of, and this is not a secular crowd, by the way. This is a regular comedy club. They looked at me and I said, oh, zombie day. You know, tomorrow is the day that Jesus rose from the dead and has been eating brains ever since. <laughs> that was the joke. <laughs> yeah, and you guys are on my side. So imagine <laughs> comedy club crowd laughed and also went, oh, at the same time, right? Well, now here we are 20 years later, and, and probably I would say 15 years later. That, that is a, a thing now. Zombie Jesus. People have zombie Jesus. You can buy a zombie Jesus t-shirt on, on Amazon. Nobody see, I mean, I'm sure people are offended by it, a zombie Jesus shirt, but it's, it's so part of our lexicon nowadays that... that, that People don't have a problem with it. If you see a kid walking down the street with a zombie Jesus t-shirt, it's not a big deal. People go, oh, okay, that's funny. Yeah, zombie Jesus, he came back from the dead. Ha ha. Yeah, you're gonna, he's going to offend some people, but he's going to offend far less people than I did that night 20 years ago saying that joke. Same thing I did another joke same, years ago about uh, when the guy first, the, the day that, the, that they found that the, the guy had the, the toast with the Jesus on it. And I said, wow, somebody ought to make a sandwich out of that. We could have a grilled cheeses. <laughs> now that's a thing. There's actually a website, grilledcheeses.com, and there's a guy who sells T-shirts with, 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 with religious icons on, on food, and they it's grilledcheeses.com. That's part of our common, you know, that, that's part of our, our societal lexicon now, to, have, to, to, to make fun of these things or, or to, to shed the light in it. And the thing is that nowadays people don't find those things as offensive and they find the humor in them, even religious people. Whereas when I told that joke again, you know, 15 years ago, people were appalled. People were really upset with me. And now you can wear people. You know, again, you can buy a, you can buy a grilled cheeses T-shirt on on eBay or on Amazon, and most people don't have a problem with it. So what that what that's doing is it's helping change our that sort of stuff helps us change our collective consciousness. It, it helps us change our beliefs as a whole, as a society, through the humor of it. Okay. If I just came out and said, started arguing about, you know, Jesus, Jesus on a piece of bread, it's, you know, stupid, and, yeah, what, and just started arguing with somebody, I'm being combative. I'm going to immediately hit a wall, right? So what I've been trying to do for the last, um, last several years is, um, is just not only do this in comedy, stand-up comedy, but find ways to get it into our, to the entertainment industry in general. Um, when you have, anybody, are, any big TV watchers? Do people watch a lot of TV? A few people? Yeah. yeah. I, have you seen, have there, have you, has anybody here seen any shows that really support critical thinking? I mean, there's not many. There's a ton of shows that do the exact opposite. There's, there's, Conservatively speaking, four billion shows that have ghosts on them. I don't know. Uh, every channel's got a ghost show and a Bigfoot show and a, and a you know, Jesus Lives show. And a, you know, everybody's got those shows. I don't, I've seen two shows. Penn & Teller's Bullshit, which was great. 
lasted a couple years. Uh, Is It Real was another show that lasted a couple years. Um, there's, there's just not much out there. So to me, what I think, what my, my goal is to find a way to have more shows, lobby for more shows, lobby for more entertainment that promotes rational thinking, that promotes critical thinking, that promotes something other than magical thinking. Um, and I realize there's no fun stories in, you know, it's fun to, it's fun to magical thinking is fun, you know, um, fairies and all that stuff is fun. It's, it's fantasy. But the problem is that when it's posed as reality on TV, it's not fantasy. So, um, so my, 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 my thoughts are that we need to find ways to one-on-one, in a public forum, in a national forum, in an international forum, find ways to use humor or music. Who was I talking to last night? Um, it was uh, a woman here last night who was, loved this, has a band, a band, and they're, they're a, a secular band, and all of their lyrics are, you know, and, and when I was a kid, like I said, I grew up in the punk rock scene, and Bad Religion was, was uh, the, a band that, that I loved, and, and I know so many people that were religious that started to pull away from their religion because they were punk rock kids who loved bad religion and they started listening to this, you know, to these lyrics and this, you know, and, and the, the singer, Greg, Greg Graffin, he's a, he's a professor, teaches at Cornell University and, and this guy is very smart and he has some incredible lyrics and people would read the, read the lyrics and hear the lyrics and they say, of music they like and all of a sudden makes them think. Again, breaks down the walls, allows ideas to, to sink in, to seep in. So, for me, it's, it's about finding the form, and I think we all need to find a way to, to, to do that and to ask people to look for more comedians who, you know, who do this sort of stuff, to musicians who do this sort of stuff, support them, support television shows, support, you know, ask for, the, for television shows, right, right to, to, to get more ideas into the public. In, into, in, to, to change the way we think about things. It's like when they say that a, a while back when all the, um, the marriage equality laws started going through and all of a sudden people who didn't vote for them before, the right wing, a lot of right wingers who were, who were against it, all of a sudden they started voting for it and the reason was that all of a sudden in the last couple of years they realized they had somebody who was gay, a friend, a cousin, a son, a daughter, and once they were able to know that person and realize that this, you know, again, now they have empathy. Now they, they, they can put themselves in that person's shoes. All of a sudden, their ideas changed. And it was that easy. It went from, I'm lobbying against, you know, gay marriage yeah, yeah, to, oh, wait. Oh, my nephew's gay. I like my nephew. Never mind. I mean, that, it's that easy. If you can get in. If you can get in there. So for me, it's, you know, it's about... Telling jokes that make, like, here's a, here's a joke of mine I'll tell that, that's not about religion. It's about making people think. It's about ghosts. A lot of people aren't religious and they still believe in ghosts. I find that funny. Because um, I don't know what, like, what do you think it is? That's what I want to know. You know what I mean? Like, if you don't believe in an afterlife, then, then what is it that's wandering around the earth? You know, I don't know what you think it is. But here, here's, here's my observation that I made. And I won't do the joke because it's like 20 minutes long. But I'll give you one observation that every single person who believes in ghosts comes up to me every time. And they go, I never thought about that. Every time. As I say, so what is a ghost? It's a soul? Is that what we're supposed to believe? It's the soul? It's it's the leftover energy of a human that wanders around in human form and repeats old patterns? Oh, that's cool. Then how come every single time I watch a ghost show or I hear a ghost story, the ghost is always wearing clothes? (laughs) Is this the soul of the suit and tie? Is it stuck on the celestial sales rack? Or what, what is... Shouldn't ghosts be naked? They should be naked, right? And every time somebody comes to me and goes, who's like a believer in ghosts, they go, oh, I never thought, why? Yeah, why, why are they wearing clothes? That doesn't make any sense. Like, yeah, it's stupid, because it's ridiculous. Like, it's ridiculous. <laughs> the idea of a ghost is ridiculous. So yes, of course it's ridiculous that they're wearing a suit or the lady in the white dress. And do they, do they have a whole wardrobe of clothes? Do they get to change into other ghostly clothes? Or are they stuck in that one set of clothes? Like, it doesn't make any sense. So, but those are the kinds of things when, when, you're, when you're doing jokes, that people will listen to. They'll say, okay, all right, all right, now, now I've got, I, I've, I've changed my perspective on it. it. It's, Bill Hicks has a great joke where he does a ton of um, 
young one started young. Sweet. <laughs> now I can swear. He's finally here. Um, anybody familiar with Bill Hicks? Yeah. Yes. Good. <laughs> Bill Hicks, a, a famous comedian, he died at 32 of uh, pancreatic cancer, but he um, very known for, for his outspoken uh, antics, his, again, he's very, very political, very anti-religious, and he has a great joke that, again, people repeat, people always come up and tell me this joke because they go, oh, you'll appreciate this, and I'm like, yeah, I, I know that joke, but he comes up to me, he, he said a guy comes up to him after a show, does a bad, he's doing a bunch of stuff about Christianity, and he goes, guy comes up to me after a show, and he goes, hey, buddy, all that stuff you said tonight, I'm a Christian, and I'm pissed off, and I'm offended. He goes, so I said, oh, you're a Christian, huh? He goes, yeah, I'm a Christian. He goes, oh, forgive me. <laughs> now, when he tells that joke, more Christians who are about to come up to him and be like, go, all right. Right? It's breaking down. So um, I find that this is what happens in my shows. So if you saw what I did last, what I do uh, uh, last night was a pretty good sample, I think, of what I do. I don't just talk about religion. I talk about process of belief. That's that's what I try to tell people. I talk about like why do we believe things? How do we believe things? Um, how do we get to those things? And, and why do we persist in these these things? That's what my entire act is about. So it's not just religion, it's not just you know, ghosts, it's not just Bigfoot or whatever. It's all these things. And here's what I find, and here's why, um, here's why, why this really sinks into me about how, you, how we can all change, you know, get people to, to talk through and change their ideas through, through humor and laughter, is that when I do shows, I'm up for an hour, I'm up for 45 minutes, and I talk about a little bit of everything. I'm an equal opportunity hater, as I like to say. Um, I don't really hate anybody, but you know, people think I hate them, so that's okay. Um, and after shows, inevitably, I always get at least one person, if not multiple people, and this is talking regular shows, not, not when I'm here at the Ethical Humanist Society or when I'm at the you know, American Atheist Convention. I'm not, I'm not getting these people, but I almost always get someone who comes up to me and they go, you know, uh, I really liked your show, except for about 10 minutes of it. And then I'm like, oh, which 10 minutes? And it's always a different 10 minutes. It's always a different five minutes. It's always a different joke. It's always, if they're really liberal, and they might be like, man, the religious stuff was killing me. So funny. Oh, I love, I love how you made fun of that. Oh, and then the Bigfoot thing. Those people are crazy, blah, blah, blah. But, but seriously, uh, alternative medicine, homeopathy, whatever, yeah, you, know, you should take your dog to get a Reiki. Because <laughs> it, it really affects them. And then I'll get people who be like, you know, you know, like, man, oh, man, that, you know, we'll get the, the more conservative guy who's like, man, that, them liberals with their stupid alternative medicine and the, your gluten allergy joke, man, I can't stand those people, but Jesus, dude. <laughs> and I realize that, that what happens, though, is that as many times as I get that, I also get people come up to me and go, hey, you know that thing you said? Is that, is that true? Is that, did, did, you, did you read about that? Yeah, 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 I read about that. There's lots of things you can read about. That. Are you sure? Because I saw a Facebook meme that said uh, otherwise. That's our new scientific studies, by the way. Have you ever had that? I saw a scientific study. No, you saw a picture with a word on it. That's not a scientific study. Um, but people come and they go, well, you know, where, where, did you, where did you read that? Where did you find that information? And I'll tell them. And they'll go, all right, I'm going to do some reading. I'll come back. Every now and then I get emails months later. Hey, I read that thing. Uh, I liked it. Now I changed my perspective a little bit. Or I get people come up and they say, you know, you made me think. You know, I mean, I, get, I also get people come up and say, I'll pray for you. I also get people come up and say, I hate you. I get people, you know, I had an hour conversation in Seattle with a woman who came up to under the preface that, you know, I feel that you think that religion and science can't live side by side. And I'm a scientist and I'm religious. I'm like, okay, that's great. Five minutes into it, she was giving me her scientific proof as to why the world was 6,000 years old <laughs> and explaining to me that, that how can I deny that every single study on prayer shows that it's effective, more effective than medicine. Somebody who claimed to be, and, and claimed to be a scientist who was telling me these things. So I get all of those, 
all of those types of people. But, but like I said, what I get almost always is someone coming up saying, I love this, I love this, I love this, I didn't get this, I hated this. And what that tells me is that they're in the audience and they're laughing for 45 minutes. They're laughing at, at me making light of things, of the absurdity of things, right? This is ridiculous, I'm gonna point out why it's ridiculous. They laugh at that. And then this is ridiculous, here's why it's ridiculous, they laugh at that. Here's, this is ridiculous, here's why it's ridiculous, they laugh at that. Then I go, this is ridiculous, here's why it's ridiculous. And they go, hey, wait, I believe in that ridiculous thing. And, but they look around and everyone else is laughing at that. And it makes a connection. And I've had multiple people tell me this directly. It made a connection that, wait a second, why aren't they laughing? Or why are they laughing and I'm not? And why is this guy not laughing at the thing I'm laughing at? And why is she laughing at something that I'm not laughing at? And why am I laughing at something that she's not laughing at? When we're all laughing at all the other, it's the same things. And they start realizing, well, wait a second, maybe I just haven't looked at this particular belief heavy, strongly enough. I haven't given it enough, I haven't reflected, I haven't examined my, my own beliefs enough. And it sinks in and they start thinking, and they, start, they start researching and they start checking into that one thing that, or those two things that, that they, that they didn't, didn't agree with. And I had this, um, I've had many arguments, I've had um, different, different, different things happen to me. Here, here's, here's the one that, that I really enjoyed. Um, I did a show in Colorado and at a big comedy club in, in Denver and, and a huge groups of people came out atheists and skeptics and, and you know, uh, humanists and all this. And I had a group of, of people that came out that were just a meetup group that saw me on meetup and they weren't affiliated with anything. They were just, they were like a singles nightlife meetup group and they thought it'd be fun to come see it. And the, and the, and the, the woman who posted it was a, was a member of, an, of a humanist meetup group. So she posted, this is what he does. Don't come out if you don't want to hear it. And they brought a big group out and afterward, they, somebody had posted on this thing, you know, well, said, he said, well, I knew what he was supposed to be about, but I, I didn't appreciate the religion bashing. And I said, well, so I went on there and I said, oh, well, what, what, what didn't you appreciate? She goes, I didn't think you were funny. I didn't like, like what you did. I said, you didn't like anything I did? And she goes, well, no, specifically, you know, this joke and this joke and this joke. I said, okay. And she goes, well, the guy who opened for you, who's a friend of mine, my friend Chris Fonseca, he's, uh, Chris has got cerebral palsy. He's in a wheelchair. Um, most of his act is about making fun of himself. He's extremely funny, and he makes fun of himself. And she goes, I liked Chris better because he makes fun of himself, and you make fun of everybody else. And she goes, and I think that's mean-spirited, and I like the fact that, that Chris can make fun of himself. She goes, I think that's an admirable quality to make fun of yourself. And I go, oh, okay, so... You're telling me that you enjoyed laughing at a guy with cerebral palsy <laughs> who's making fun of himself for having cerebral palsy. But, and you laughed at when I made fun of Muslims. You masked, laughed when I made fun of Bigfoot. You laughed when I made fun of racists. You laughed when I made fun of all these other things. But when it came to you, you thought that wasn't funny. And she said, yes. And I went, I went and copy and pasted her thing that said, I enjoy people who like to laugh at them, who, who understand that it's best to laugh at themselves. And I put that down there, put it back there. I said, yeah, well, I enjoy people who like best to laugh at themselves, boom. And she went, all right, touche. But I, it was like, <laughs> and that was it. And everybody else, because there were other people involved in the conversation that were, that were that, but it, the point again, she didn't, she didn't realize w her own words. She had convinced her, herself that, that I was being, and, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm making fun of everybody, including myself. I make fun of stuff that I believed in or that I used to believe in or that I still believe in. That's what I do. And, and the whole point is to make fun of, or I don't even like the word make fun of, but, but to, to make light of these things that we believe in for no reason. That's, they're funny. That's, it's funny that we should believe anything without reason, right? Um, and that was like one of my great, my, one, of, one of my favorite moments because it was, you know, a two-day email or, you know, forum battle that eventually ended in this angry person saying, okay, I was being the ass. That's, you know, and, and hopefully she changed her perspective a little bit. Um, and, and I found that interesting. It, but um, I just wanted to say, I think going here, but I, uh, 
that I think also that I, I'm talking about comedy, that's what I know. I'm a comedian. But all, all art does this in a way, doesn't it? Like I said, music, paintings. Um, we're holding a mirror, comic strips. I mean, if you don't believe that comic strips can affect people, um, you know, we can look to what happened in France recently. It, it's things, little, a comic strip is powerful enough to make people, to offend somebody that much or open up a, I mean, it's sad what, has to, what happens and what has to happen, but the point is that these things affect people and, and, and if you can do it in a way that's, that's, that's not, I mean, some people you just, you can't help but offend. You know, you just, if a comic strip is gonna make you do that, then there's not, nothing you can do. But if there are people that are more, more open, more, more liberal, more on the fence, they might see that comic strip and go, oh, well, that's kind of funny and break down, break down that wall. So for me, it's, again, supporting these arts and supporting these artists and, and, and having more of them out to have a voice to reach new people who, who, don't, who aren't here at the Ethical Humanist Society. We're all, you know, literally preaching to the choir, right? Um, and so it's, um, and I'll just, I'll just share this one for, for you guys. This is my, I, I did this bit. This is the only bit I was gonna do. Um, I don't really want to, I don't really, didn't want to do comedy, but I'll tell you, I'll show you guys this bit because people like this bit. And it's my favorite thing to do, honestly, aside from, you know, making fun of religion, apparently, um, is uh, I love talking about my kid. Because um, my daughter, I think my daughter, my daughter's sharp. She's really sharp. She, you know, and of course, I, like I said, she, she reminds me of me and I love myself. So, um, <laughs> so that's pretty cool. No, but I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this story. This one little humorous story. This is what I, how I close my show a lot. And the reason I tell the, the reason I tell the story, or the reason it closes my show, is because again, it opens up. This one is a really a real breakdown for a lot of people. And I've had this people who are in the same mindset as me come up and they go, oh, "I love that story." But I also have a lot of people who who are not in the mindset of me, who, who are religious or, or or the otherwise, who come up to me and they just love this story. And, um, and I see that little bit, of, little bit of change in their mind. And this story wraps up my entire thing. The story is about, about critical thinking and the story is about, about, um, about the way we should look at things. And so this is when I was, I was putting together, I did an hour comedy special um, and uh, I was writing material for it and I was, I was trying to come up with a new hour, hour and a half of material from scratch. And, which is, as a comedian, sometimes it takes 10 years to come up with an hour of material, and I was trying to do this in six months, and, um, and I wanted it to all be about critical thinking and, and, and this sort of stuff. So I was really, really working hard, and I was trying to come up with a bit about original sin, the concept of original sin in the Bible. And um, I was talking to a friend, another comedian friend in the car, and I had the car on speakerphone, and my daughter was in the back. At the time, my daughter was six, just about seven, and uh, I was talking to my friend, and said, coming up with an idea about for original sin. I go, what, what would be a good joke for original sin? Like, what could we do that, what could I do that would be different? You know, and we'd bounce an ideas around. Couldn't come up with anything I liked. Hung up the phone. My daughter goes, Dad, um, what's original sin? And I'm like, wow, this is, this is weird. I, I don't know how to explain this to you because you're, you don't know the Bible. She's never been subjected to the Bible. She knows nothing about, she doesn't even know the concept. She doesn't even know what I'm talking about. So I said, well, I'm gonna, uh, would you mind if I give you an analogy? And she said, no, that's fine. I said, okay, you know how dad says, don't put your fingers in your food? She goes, yeah. Said, All right, well, let's say dad's God. And I say, don't put your fingers in your food. And if you do, I'm gonna have to punish you and everybody else for all eternity by punching them in the face. <laughs> then a couple weeks go by and we're eating dinner and you put your fingers in your food and I go, I warned you. Uh, I'm sorry, now I'm gonna to have to punch everybody in their face. And that's what I do, I wander the earth and I just start punching people in their face. And I'm punching people in their face. And I'm wandering around punching people in their face. People are like, why are you punching me in the face? I'm like, I'm punching you in the face because she put her fingers in her food. That's called justice, all right? <laughs> then after a couple of thousand years or a few million, de depending on whose book you read, um, I think to myself, I might be being a tad bit irrational. So I'm going to have another child, this time a son, and I'm gonna punch him in the face. And that's what I do is I just wander the earth punching this kid in the face. And people are appalled by that as they should be. They're like, why are you punching that kid in the face? I'm like, I'm punching this kid in the face so that I don't have to punch you in the face because she put her fingers in her food. 
So my daughter in the back seat starts cracking up. She's laughing her ass off. She's because she knows dad's a comedian. She goes, Dad, stop it. Stop it. Can you be serious for one time in your life? Quit joking around and tell me the story. Tell me the real story. Tell me what really happened. I said, fine. God creates these two people, Adam and Eve, and he puts them in this garden, basically, and he says, you know, don't eat this fruit from the tree of knowledge. There's a forbidden tree of knowledge. We cannot have you thinking or learning, so do not <laughs> eat the fruit from the tree of knowledge. And then uh, a little while goes by, and a talking snake comes along, and uh, he says, no, don't worry about that guy. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Go ahead and eat the fruit. So they eat the fruit, and then uh, God goes, ah. I told you, I warned you, and now I'm going to have to send you and everybody else to hell to burn in fire for all eternity. And that's what he does. If you're born, sorry, it's original sin. You've got to go to hell. You're born, you go to hell. Sorry, you're born. It's original sin. Just being born makes you go to hell. I'm sorry, you're going to hell. You're going to hell. Why? I'm sorry, she, she ate some fruit. It's not my fault. It's called justice. And uh, after a couple of thousand years or a you know, few million, depending on whose book you read, uh, God says to himself, I might be being a tad bit irrational. So I'm going to have another child, uh, again, this time a son, and murder him uh, so that you don't have to go to hell because this chick ate some fruit. So at this point, my daughter gets angry at me. She goes, Daddy, I said stop it. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Now quit joking around and tell me what really happened. And I just looked at her, I was like, you know what, baby girl, that is the appropriate response. And then it made me think about it. it, it what, what, the reason, the reason I, I like to close, close with that joke is that, again, we get it, but a lot of people, it takes them that story, and everyone thinks the story's cute, and it's 100% true, almost word for word true. People think it's cute. People are like, oh it's, oh, it's so funny. Your daughter sounds funny. Your daughter sounds pretty cute. Uh, but what they do, the other thing they, 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 they come across that is, is they realize, and again, we realize this without even me telling you that joke, but a lot of people don't realize that, that those two stories to us are so equally ridiculous. To a six-year-old, those stories are equally ridiculous. So equally ridiculous that she can't discern the difference between which one was made up and which one millions of people believe. And when somebody who actually believes those things sees me do that bit, it sinks in. It really does. They, I've had, again, multiple people come up and say, yeah, I never, never really, really gave it much thought. I never gave it much thought. I hear that all the time. I never gave that much thought. I never thought about that. Never, I never thought about that. So all my thing is, if I made you think about it, I did my job. And that's my job, is to make people think about it. So um, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Um.